So, uh, good afternoon. My name is Chris Smith. I'm a chairman of the Subcommittee on Global Human Rights, Global Health, and International Organizations of the Foreign Affairs Committee. I represent a district in New Jersey. I'm now currently serving in my 44th year as a member of Congress and focus very, very aggressively on human rights abuse around the world. I'm the author of, of many human rights laws, including the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 and four subsequent uh, anti-human trafficking laws, as well as four laws on religious freedom uh, and many other laws that deal with democracy uh, and human rights. Since late 2022, Brazilians have been subject to human rights violations committed by Brazilian officials on a very large scale documented or credibly reported rights violations in Brazil include the political abuse of legal procedures to persecute political opposition, including jailing opposition figures on spurious charges, violations of freedom of speech and media freedom, including persecution of journalists, the silencing of opposition media, the banning of individuals from social media, thinly veiled censorship laws claiming to fight so-called disinformation, and many violations of the rule of law and judicial malfeasance. Already in December of 2022, Mary O'Grady, who writes a weekly column on Latin America for the Wall Street Journal, noted the danger, and she said, and I quote her in part, a greater threat is the 11-member Supreme Court, which is overstepping its jurisdiction and flouting the rule of law for political reasons without consequences. When the highest court becomes an ally of ideological and corrupt politicians, democracy is in grave danger. Brazil has arrived at such a moment, she goes on. The court censored other political speech from business leaders, elected members of Congress, and news and entertainment platforms on the right. This has been carried out with assistance from electoral tribunals, special advisory uh, to combat disinformation. It acts as a ministry of truth, so-called. In January of 2023, even the New York Times reported referring to Brazilian Supreme Court Justice Alexandria Moraes, quote, using a broad interpretation of the court's powers, he has pushed to investigate and prosecute, as well as to silence on social media, anyone who deems, he deems, a menace to Brazil's institutions. He has jailed people without trial, for posting threats on social media, helps sentence a sitting congressman to nearly nine years in prison for threatening the court, ordered raids on businessmen with little evidence of wrongdoing, suspended an elected governor from his job, and unilaterally blocked dozens of accounts and thousands of posts on social media with virtually no transparency or room for appeal. In the hunt for justice after the riot this month, he went on, or the New York Times went on, he has, be he has become further emboldened. He orders his orders to ban prominent voices online have proliferated, close quote. That's the New York Times. Many Brazilians have maintained that concerns regarding these issues have become much more serious since January 2023, and that such violations have gravely undermined democracy, freedom, and the rule of law in Brazil. As chairman of the Global Human Rights Committee, I am committed to supporting internationally recognized human rights in Brazil and to conducting oversight on the response of the U.S. government to these violations. I will chair a hearing on human rights abuse in my subcommittee in the coming weeks. What I see in Brazil today, above all, in the investigations of the Supreme Court Justice De uh, Moraes is called rule by law. The opposite of rule of law. Rule of law is supposed to put aside outside law outside of politics so that the same laws apply equally to all people. Rule by law, in contrast, means that while some forms and procedures of law are maintained, the law is used selectively as an instrument of political power. There is vast evidence that this is exactly what is going on in Brazil today where investigations, inquiries, media bans, content removal orders are used to single out the opposition to President Lula. I am preparing legislation that will address these issues. We will call it the Brazil Democracy, Freedom, and Human Rights Act, and I hope to be introducing it very shortly. We will hear now from
from Brazilians, including elected officials, that I believe their position and responsibilities as elected officials make them a truly valuable source of insight into the situation in Brazil and uniquely qualified to present the concerns of the people of Brazil. I, I, uh, we will be joined, I believe, by Congressman Ronnie Jackson as well, who has expressed he's a rear admiral for uh, 25 years of naval service, a member of Congress from the great state of Texas. Uh, he's in total solidarity with what we're doing uh, today, and he should be coming along uh, if he's not here yet. Uh, but I would like to introduce Eduardo Bolsonaro, a member of the Chamber of Deputies of Brazil, for any comments that he might have. First of all, thank you, Chris, to give us this opportunity. We are very honored, and we want to bring here some light for what is going on in Brazil. My name is Eduardo Bolsonaro. I'm the most voted ever congressman in the history of Brazil, also son of President Bolsonaro and former chairman of the Foreign Affairs and National Defense Committee. I have always warned in my speeches in the Congress about the dangers of my country turning into a Cuba or Venezuela with their concentration camps. Today, unfortunately, I live in my own movie about, in, about the Gulag. And for those who think I'm exaggerating, I will sit here few simple names. Philip Martins, the international advisor to President Bolsonaro, as Jared Kushner was to President Trump. A brilliant young man in his 30s with a promising future, imprisoned by an exception tribunal, accused of a coup d'etat never attempted or planet, and without the hope of minimally fair treatment, as due process and broad defense no longer exists in Brazil. Colonel Camara, the Bolsonaro security detail, who is now also in jail, accused of an imaginary coup d'etat. And like them, veterinarians, gospel singers, sign language interpreters, comedians as Bismarck Fugas, and even a homeless and a person diagnosed, diagnosed with a high degree of autism, all of them imprisoned, accused of a coup d'etat. It's very clear that all this oppression and cruelty is just a step towards the ultimate goal to imprison my father, the president who dared to put the interests of Brazilians first. My father is now prosecuted and slandered in the most various ways. As in every tyranny, the limit of the ridiculous no longer exists. And he even faces the accusation of having committed the terrible crime of disturbing a whale. That's not a joke. He's criminally charged for passing by a whale on a jet ski. And the most impressive thing is, thing is the complaint was made by Lula da Silva's environmental minister. This is more ridiculous than what Trump's charge, than what Trump is having uh, as charged here in the United States. My father is also accused of attempt, attempting a coup d'etat when he was no longer president. The judiciary, appointed by the Communist Party in power, want us to believe that my father waited to leave power and when he no longer had the armed forces under his command, attempted a coup d'etat with elderly and unarmed women, all of these thousands of kilometers away from Brazil when my father was in vacations in the United States. Going to the end, they want us to believe, Mr. Chris Smith, that women, elderly ladies, and all kinds of ordinary citizens, unarmed, are a danger to the rule of law. And those violating the rights and fundamental guarantees guarantees are the saviors. Ladies and gentlemen, these stories are not something that someone told me. We are living this right now, and with not even a single world, world, word from Biden administration, State Department, or any governmental authority from the homeland of democracy, the United States of America. The dozen colleagues that are following me here also will talk about terrifying situations. Brazil, unfortunately, is not a democracy anymore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Eduardo. I'd like to now introduce Gustavo Geyer, who is a member of the Council of Deputies. 
first, I'd like to thank you, uh, Congressman, for giving us time and a platform thank you. to come here today and talk about what's happening in Brazil. This is something that we no longer have in our nation. We no longer have the privilege of saying the truth, saying what we think, and giving our opinion. So to start, I'd like to ask you a simple question. Is Venezuela a democracy or a dictatorship? I believe all of you here today agree with me that Venezuela is not a democracy. It's far from it. It's a dictatorship. But then I have another question. Does Venezuela have a Supreme Court? Does Venezuela have a Ministry of Education? Does Venezuela have Congress? Does Venezuela have a, a public ministry? No. Yes, yes, they have. But they are no longer a democracy. Because all these institutions that are valuable for a democracy have been kidnapped and are served as an instrument of oppression. They are served only as to arrest and oppress people for their opinions. And what we have today in Brazil is exactly the same thing. Our Supreme Court in Brazil does not protect the Constitution anymore. As a matter of fact, they are releasing drug dealers, they are releasing criminal leaders of trafficking, and they are putting in prison congressmen, simple people, for their opinions. The reason why the leader of opposition is not here today, Carlos Jorge, the leader of the opposition in our Congress is not here today because he had his passport seized. He can no longer leave his country to tell the world what's happening in Brazil. Many other congressmen are not here today because they have had their passport seized. There's something called a fishing expedition. Pretty much everyone beside me here today has suffered. We've had our houses invaded by the federal police on a decision of Alexandre de Moraes, trying to fight something against us because we tell the truth, because of our opinions. In Brazil, the most dangerous thing you can do today is tell your opinion, speak, about your, speak your mind. But if you do drug dealing, if you murder people, if you do any other crime, you will be defended, actually. So we are here today using this platform that you so gratefully give, gave us to tell the world that Brazil is no longer a democracy. What is happening in our country can happen in your country as well. Pay attention to our country. There was a poll conducted recently in Brazil to 3,000 people, I believe, asking them if they believe they live in a democracy or if they live in a dictatorship of the judiciary. Believe it or not, half the people answered that we live today under a uh, 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 dictatorship of judiciary. Half the population of our country understands that Brazil is no longer a democracy. More than half of the congressmen also believe that, also understand that, but they are afraid to act. And the reason they are afraid to act is because the moment we try to pass a bill, giving back to Congress the, the leadership or the right to pass bill or to legislate, we immediately suffer intimidation. Phone calls from ministers of the justice uh, arrest, harassing and threatening congressmen if they don't do exactly what the Supreme Court says. So I'm here today representing the leader of the opposition, Carlos Jorge, who was not able to be here today, representing Daniel Silveira, a congressman who was also arrested, and many others. Carla Zambelli, who cannot be here today because her passport was uh, uh, seized. This can no longer continue the way it is. I, and to finish, I would like you to take a look at the faces of all my friends who are here beside me today, these brave men and women. These people now are at risk of the moment we set foot back in Brazil. We can be arrested, we can suffer a search and seizure, we can have our lives destroyed. Why? Because of corruption? Because we steal public money? No, because we're fighting for a real democracy. Yeah. Because we don't want to see Brazil become in a Venezuela if, it's not, if that's not too late. So I would like to thank every congressman and congresswoman who are standing here beside me today for having the courage to come here and commit a crime in Brazil, which is tell the truth. Thank you very much, Congressman. Gustavo, thank you for that very, very powerful, as well as you, uh, Eduardo, as well, very, very powerful witness, uh, and for standing up for the people of Brazil. You know, we stand in solidarity with the people of Brazil, uh, not with oppression, and uh, that's what you are doing, that's what you want, that's your vision, and uh, so thank you. We will now hear from Marcel Van Hatten, a member of the Chamber of Deputies uh, of Brazil. Thank you, Chris. Thank you in the name of the Brazilian people for this opportunity we have here 
to speak up, to say what is going on in Brazil more freely than we can do in our own country, unfortunately. Thank you, America, for the long-standing relationship with Brazil. The United States of America is the largest democracy in the Americas. Brazil is the second largest, or used to be. We all know that democracy is an ongoing process, while freedom, as Ronald Reagan once said, is not passed on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. This is why we are here, to fight for our freedoms and to call to the world's attention the severe setbacks we are experiencing today in Brazil's democracy, freedom, and rule of law. When I first arrived in Washington, D.C., 15 years ago to study at Georgetown University, and I'm very proud of that, I looked at Latin America and saw how socialism was subverting countries that were once democracies. Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador. While those countries were succumbing to tyrants like Hugo Chavez and other puppets of Fidel Castro, and while their people were losing their freedoms, Brazil remained democratic despite the country's historical institutional flaws and endemic corruption. That was the year 2009. Throughout the decade of 2010, Brazil entered a new era in which I was very optimistic. We all were. It was a period of time when millions of concerned citizens took to the streets to protest widespread corruption pervading our country's leadership. Operation Car Wash brought these issues to justice and put dozens of businessmen, public servants and politicians behind bars for money laundering and corruption including the then former president Lula da Silva. He was found guilty as charged in three instances and sent to jail to serve a nine-year sentence. Not only in Brazil, by the way, but also Peru, Guatemala and Panama had presidents convicted by corruption in their countries because of the investigations that started in Brazil involving transnational companies that also operated abroad. However, in the beginning of 2019, Operation Car Wash began investigating another branch of power in Brazil, the judiciary. Whistleblowers exposed bribing schemes in the justice system all the way to the Supreme Court. When the story was published in the media, all hell broke loose. The Supreme Court's president at the time, Dias Toffoli, an alleged participant in the bribing scheme, decided to censor Cruzoé magazine and opened an investigation accusing them of, of spreading fake news. Justice Toffoli appointed Justice Alexandre de Moraes to become the rapporteur judge of the case. The investigation, actually an inquisition, has the Supreme Court as an alleged victim, investigator and judge at the same time. It is still open five years later and has been weaponized to persecute anyone whom the court itself understands to be criticizing it or opposing the views of its members. The number of people criminally prosecuted, or should I say more accurately, persecuted, by Justice Moraes and the court abound to thousands of Brazilians right now. Some of those here, some of those can't return to the country from ordinary citizens to members of parliament, including the leader of the opposition, as just mentioned by my colleague Gustavo Geyer, journalists, opinion makers, and even judges. We have a judge right here that also asked for political asylum in the United States and is living here right now. From a homeless individual who was just absolved by Mr. Moraes after serving a lengthy prison sentence for being at the January 8th event by chance to the former president of the Republic, Bolsonaro. Nobody escapes the rage and unconstitutional acts and decisions of the court. Assets frozen illegally, bank accounts secretly breached with no due process, passports taken, censorship, even torture. This is the case of Mr. Clériston Pereira da Cunha, known in Brazil as Clezão, who died in prison after spending 11 months in poor health conditions behind bars, including two and a half months after an order for his release that was signed by the general prosecutor, but it was ignored by Mr. Alexandre de Moraes. On the other hand, the convictions of corrupt politicians are being annulled by the Supreme Court, as was the case of Lula, who was released from jail and allowed to campaign for the presidency again, by a Supreme Court decision contrary to the ruling of the lower courts. 
businesses that were fined for their bribing schemes are being absolved too. And the fines are being cancelled by the same court. What we are experiencing in Brazil right now is a developing dictatorship. It is therefore not surprising that Lula da Silva's biggest allies are dictators, such as Venezuela's Maduro, China's Xi Jinping, and Russia's Vladimir Putin. And Hamas. Even the terrorist group Hamas sent congratulations to Lula as he returned to power and is now congratulating Lula on his absurd remarks towards Jews and the state of Israel comparing the legitimate defense acts of Israel to the Holocaust in Germany's Hitler, in Hitler's Germany, sorry. Different than other dictatorships, however, the one we are seeing in Brazil is built in a more subtle and dangerous way. The judicial system itself is leading the institutional rupture, which makes it more difficult for the world to understand this sad and dangerous process. People tend to trust judges more than they tend to, t to trust politicians. In Brazil, however, trust in the Supreme Court has fallen dramatically. A recent poll by Atlas Intel shows that more than 50% of the population has lost completely the trust in the courts, corroborating the feeling that the decisions of the Supreme Court are rather political than legal, constitutional, or just. I repeat, Mr. Congressman, our goal here is to make the situation well known to the world. We love our country. We love Brazil. We love the United States of America. We love freedom and we love democracy. And we understand that these virtues are only possible where there is strong rule of law. 15 years after living in the city of Washington, D.C., as a student, I look back to my own country, now as a member of Congress, with maybe a more realistic view, if not sad. This very opportunity that you give us, however, to share this message with you, with the American people, and with all the world, renews our optimism and hope. As much as we love America, none of us want to live in another country. We want to live in another Brazil. God bless America. God bless Brazil. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Marcel, thank you for that very eloquent defense of the people of Brazil and for speaking so boldly as you all have uh, a message that needs to be heard by Congress, by the White House, by the State Department, and frankly by the world. So thank you so very much for that. Paolo um, Figueredo, uh, an independent award-winning journalist who is, um, uh, we have met and we've spoken and I've learned so much from him. I want to thank him for being here. Uh, Paolo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. How's everyone doing? It's a beautiful, whoops. A beautiful day here in the capital and a historical day for Brazil. So I want to express my gratitude uh, to Congress to Congressman Smith. You are a true champion of the human rights and a friend of the Brazilian people. So I would like to ask for a round of applause to Congressman Smith. He is unbelievable. He is unbelievable. He renews my faith in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you as a living testament of Brazil's democracy crisis. Until 2022, I was the most watched political journalist in the country during prime time on cable TV. At that time, I also had 5 million followers across various social media platforms. Then, overnight, my social media was blocked in Brazil my Brazilian passport was canceled and my bank accounts were frozen by order of the Supreme Court Justice Alexandre de Moraes. Ten days later, under Lula da Silva, the Brazilian Department of Justice launched an investigation against the network I worked for, Jovem Pan, whom you all know, which then fired all the conservative commentators, inclu including my colleagues, Marco Antonio Costa and Gerson Gomes, who are actually here in the audience today. The persecution recently escalated with a ridiculous, ridiculous claim that I had participated in a coup simply by accurately reporting on the behind the scene activities of the Brazilian armed forces. This is called reporting, journalism. The legacy media should try it sometime. 
I have been living in the United States for the better part of a decade, but now it's different. I live in exile, unable to return to my homeland. I wish I could say I'm the only one in this situation, but I'm not. Dozens of journalists are being persecuted, with several also exiled here in the U.S. I must mention the notable case of journalist Alan Dos Santos, present here in the audience, whose arrest was ordered by Justice Moraes for crimes of opinion and the extradition denied by the United States government. Or the case of the liberal podcaster Monarch, who I guess is also here today, having fled to America after his social media platforms were taken down and his life was ruined by Justice Moraes for merely questioning our electoral system and the ongoing censorship in Brazil. Thousands, no, tens of thousands of ordinary citizens had their social media taken down by the same Alexander de Moraes. My friends, I assure you, these are all facts. And regardless of your political stance, you do not want to live in a country where one man can determine what can be said. That's why this violates all human rights and international treaties, even the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which guarantees freedom of expression and of the press, regardless of frontiers. All this also violates my rights, protected under the Constitution of the United States of America, since all my journalist activity was conducted while living here, therefore under American jurisdiction and protected by the sacred First Amendment. Let me put it clearly. What's happening in Brazil is criminal. And unfortunately, this crime has accomplices here in America as well. Some of these accomplices are often there, often there in this beautiful house that is supposed to be a beacon for the free world. Others are just a few blocks away on Pennsylvania Avenue. Again, this is merely stating the facts. According to numerous press reports, the Biden administration has spared no effort to interfere in the Brazilian election to guarantee the election of Lula da Silva. Even now, friends of George Soros and the Foro de São Paulo and the Democratic Party seek to silence our voices. And how did Lula da Silva repay all these good services provided by the Democrats? He has antagonized every single American interest globally, aligning Brazil with Hamas, Venezuela, Cuba, Russia, Iran, and of course, China. Under his leadership within the BRICS, Brazil has actively working with China towards ending the dollar's dominance as the international trade currency. This must end. I urge the United States Congress members to exert their oversight responsibilities to promote the American geopolitical interests and to restore the inalienable human rights given to all of us by our Creator. As this country founding fathers so well described, this is what we ask for. God bless America. God bless Brazil. Oh, thank you so very much. And thanks for reminding us of what Lula has done since taking office. Uh, you know, I chair the China Commission. I've chaired 99 congressional hearings on human rights abuse by the People's Republic of China, by the Chinese Communist Party, and especially under Xi Jinping, where he is actually committed, committing current day genocide against the Uyghurs. Uh, and then Lula, when asked, uh, does nothing but fawn over Xi Jinping. Ditto for Maduro, ditto for uh, Cuba, and of course, uh, it, it is very discouraging when the president of a country compares, not discouraging, it's outrageous, as you have pointed out, uh, compares Israel and what they're doing against a terrorist attack by Hamas. Yes. And I would remind everyone to reme not, not just look at what they do, read what they say. The Hamas Charter of 1988 makes clear that they want every Jew dead. It couldn't be clearer, and they want the end, the evisceration of Israel itself. Uh, and yet he compares, Lulu that is, compares what they're doing to defend themselves against Hamas uh, to be equivalent 
uh, to the Holocaust. That is outrageous. So thank you for reminding us of that. Uh, our final speaker and will we be. We are sorry as Brazilians to hear our president to say so, such absurd. Andres Martinez Fernandez, who is Senior Policy Analyst for Latin America at the Heritage Foundation, um, and who will speak now. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Um, when I was approached by the Congressman uh, to engage on these issues, what we're seeing in Brazil, I was eager to accept because uh, what we're observing is a very dangerous decline in the basic fundamentals of democracy and, and human rights in, in Brazil. And unfortunately, it's, it's not getting attention. And I, and I think the scope of this, obviously, we've heard, but uh, the, the attendance that we have here from these prominent leaders in Brazil coming all the way here to highlight this challenge um, underlines the gravity of the situation in Brazil. Uh, so I thank all of you and, and congressmen for highlighting this issue. Uh, unfortunately, what we're seeing um, in, in the case of Brazil is, uh, is a very dangerous but not new trend uh, for Latin America and, and the world in which we see the criminalization of dissent and opposition, uh, the use of state power and uh, judicial prosecutions to silence dissent and to empower a uh, a certain ideological or leading ruler. And, and that's that's what we've seen time and again throughout the region. And uh, uh, as, as some have pointed out in Venezuela, uh, it, it, it took that country uh, down the path of, of crisis. And I worry that we are seeing a similar uh, tendency in Brazil. And certainly what we're seeing, uh, we, we heard from these, uh, these speakers aligns with that <coughs> severity of this concern. A and for those who think that this is going to be uh, this kind of um, politic politicization of judicial activism is limited to just a few uh, opposition voices, uh, th this, is, this is going to expand beyond uh, that. And we're already seeing that with, uh, with uh, new actions going after independent NGOs uh, which are well respected in this city, including uh, particularly Transparency International, which has been targeted by uh, investigation in the Supreme Court uh, for highlighting some of the abuses uh, that, that they are seeing, uh, some of the malpractice uh, in, in the judicial system in Brazil. Uh, that has been uh, rewarded with, uh, with a special fishing expedition, as, as some have, have highlighted uh, in Brazil against that organization. So, so this is something that um, I, I hope we see more attention uh, from the media and from outside of just the right of center uh, block, because this is really a, uh, an issue that addresses and, and impacts the, the broader freedom of speech and political rights. In, uh, in a country which is the, the largest, uh, economically speaking, in, in Latin America and has very, very significant implications for the United States. Uh, we've already heard some of the, um, the challenges that we've seen as far as the current leadership in Brazil uh, not aligning with the United States, uh, working in, in many uh, instances uh, at cross purposes with the United States and U.S. influence in the region. Um, but despite that, we, we've really seen silence from the Biden administration. Uh, and if anything, uh, a, a praise for, for the current government. We saw Secretary Blinken very recently down in Brazil praising the uh, government for its actions on workers' rights and environmental rights, uh, but no mention of the, the endangerment of political speech and dissent. Uh, and unfortunately, this is this is a consequence of a broader trend that that we've seen with this administration, particularly in Latin America, of, of a deeply ideological uh, focus and alignment for its its foreign policy and its engagement in the region. So, I mean, you could be assured that if we were seeing a fraction of what we're seeing in Brazil, uh, if we were seeing that in Argentina, 
uh, under President Millet or, or any other conservative government, the, the United States would have by now issued numerous statements and unleashed sanctions uh, uh, to, to respond. So this is, this is a situation that merits response from the United States uh, to ensure that we do not see Brazil go down a, uh, a dangerous path that it's, it's treading on uh, currently. So I thank you once again to everyone for, uh, for coming here and highlighting this, uh, coming all the way from Brazil, and also to uh, Congressman Smith for, for highlighting this issue. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, any questions from the press? I would ask, and I would appeal to you, to really ask hard questions of the Lulu government. Uh, there are people here who are putting themselves at risk. We will follow their return very carefully, and I can tell you that there will be no stone left unturned if any harm comes to any of these amazingly courageous men and women who have traveled here. Um, you know, uh, it, it's just, sadly, Brazil is moving in the direction of anarchy, uh, and the rule by law, as I said before, where they use, you know, prosecutions against people with whom they disagree with as a way of, of uh, just silencing the opposition. We saw it uh, in, in Nicaragua most recently when all of the presidential candidates were arrested. Uh, so Ortega had nobody running against him. Uh, we saw it when he arrested everybody in the church, including Bishop Alvarez. Uh, who has now been let go, but he's been exiled. So what I'm saying is that we are going to be following this very carefully, and it's not just me. It, is, it will be bipartisan, uh, and my hope is that the administration will join us. These men and women are men and women of courage uh, and of, of great valor, and, um, uh, and their, their words need to be heard. So please investigate, I say to the press. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.